Alrighty, so John 4, 43 to 54. After the two days, he left for Galilee. Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, for they also had been there. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, Come down before my child dies. Jesus replied, You may go. Your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, The fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he and all his household believed. This was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed, having come from Judea to Galilee. So that's the word of God for today. So today we just have a relatively smaller passage that we're focusing on. (laughs) Okay, somebody's going out there. Can uh, someone grab the door there? Cool, thank you. Awesome. Okay, so we've been going through John, and we're up to the end of chapter 4 today. And I don't know how you guys have been feeling about John's gospel. Have you guys been enjoying studying John's gospel together? Yeah, yeah. Well, if, you know, I was thinking it might be good to refresh our thinking about what is the theme of John's gospel. What is the... What's the basic idea that is coming across, if there is one that you're finding? Um, believe, okay, yeah, faith. Faith is a big deal in John's gospel. And John John himself says that he wrote these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John himself says that's the purpose of why he wrote these things, uh, faith. Um, I think the theme is basically Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, and our response to him. Because if you're noticing, as we've been going along, there's a lot of information about how different people respond to Jesus. So it's like Jesus, and then how people respond to Jesus. So um, just recalling you back to the prologue of John's Gospel, the first 18 verses, Um, It talks about the light that shines in the darkness, the true light is coming into the world. And then it talks about how people uh, received the light. And many people, it says, um, didn't welcome him or didn't receive him or didn't, didn't acknowledge him, but some people did. And those people who received him, uh, God gave them the right to become children of God to those who received him, who believed in his name. So this idea of responding to Jesus and what is our response to Jesus? How do you you meet with Jesus? How do you encounter him? How do you hear from him? And then how do you respond to him is a major theme, I think, for John. And we saw, for example, we've seen the disciples responding to Jesus. We saw uh, the Jewish leaders at the temple responding to Jesus. We saw many people at the Passover feast that Jesus was at in Jerusalem responding to him. And then we kind of zoomed in to some individuals, and that's where we are today. There's three individuals that Jesus relates to. First one was Nicodemus, so a a Pharisee, Jewish leader, and then a Samaritan woman. And now we see in today's passage this uh, royal official who came up to Jesus. This royal official... Um, there's some dispute about who he is, or people are not totally sure about this guy's identity. We don't know a ton about who this guy was. We know that he was a royal official, and being a royal official, um, he probably 
was working for King Herod, Herod Antipas at the time, who wasn't really quite a king. He was a, he was a tetrarch. So he was a ruler over one quarter of a territory. And specifically, he was a ruler over Galilee, the Galilean territory. Um, so this guy was like a, a, an official at Herod's court. He would have been like a, a chief sort of official guy working for Herod. And so many of the Jewish people would have regarded this guy as kind of, um, kind of corrupt or despised. We don't know if he was Jewish or he was a Gentile. He could have been either. If he, e either way, a lot of uh, mainstream Jews would have regarded him as kind of a, a bad guy because of his collaboration with Herod Antipas. And uh, uh, that, that whole governmental system was sort of orchestrated and under the auspices of Rome, of the Roman Empire. So many people had a bad, uh, bad feeling towards this. And if we look at how the gospel is going, so a lot of people see this guy as pro quite likely a Gentile, or at least he's in the category of at least as low, low class as the Gentiles. And you kind of see the movement of Jesus in these individuals, from Nicodemus, who's like a Jewish guy, religious leader, to Samaria, who were kind of like half Jewish, partially Jewish, but kind of blended, to outward to, to the Gentile territory. And that's how we see the movement of Jesus. When he came to this world, he starts out in Jerusalem and in Judea, and then he moves out to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that's how his church moved and expanded from Jerusalem to Samaria to the ends of the earth. Um, so that's the movement of God's grace. God's grace flowing out. And so we're seeing God's grace flowing, and we saw God's grace among the Samaritans, and today God's grace to this uh, royal official who uh, was working for Herod. But all these responses and all these movements, and some people responded well, and some people responded not so well. If we're looking at Nicodemus, right, how did he respond to Jesus? arguably not so well, at least not at first. I mean, he's basically like, what? How can this be? How? I don't get it. And then Jesus just keeps, and he kind of just disappears, right? Samaritan woman, on the other hand, we see this beautiful response. She seems to accept Jesus' words and his, his teaching and his person. And then she goes and tells her whole village and ends up bringing out like this whole village of Samaritans to come and see Jesus and they themselves are also respond to Jesus' words and they receive him and they welcome him and they say, now we know that he's the savior of the world and they proclaim out and testify as their witness. And we see another response to Jesus in today's passage. I think in a way this, this story is very simple, but it's another example for us of how to respond to Jesus in faith and how to, how to have faith in Jesus. So yeah, I think that faith is a is a big theme. Okay, so let's um, let's go to the first couple of verses here. It says after the two days, th that was the two days that Jesus spent with the Samaritans. Uh, he left for Galilee. Then in parentheses, it says in verse forty four. Um, now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. That's just a little verse to set up what's happening next. It seems like an interesting setup because the next verse says, when he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. Well, Galilee was kind of his home country. That's where Jesus was from. And he's going back to closer to where he was raised and brought up and, and where he was from. Um, and it says that they welcomed him. And then it says they had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, for they also had been there. So, what kind of a welcome was this? And is this like a contradiction? Jesus goes, look, a prophet doesn't have any honor in his own co country, and then he goes to his own country, and then he gets welcomed? So what's going on here? You know, I think there's, there's a clue in thinking about what kind of a welcome this was and why these people were welcoming him. Uh, so they had been at the Passover feast, and they saw Jesus doing these miraculous signs. They saw the miraculous signs that Jesus was doing. And if you skip back, if you've got a Bible with you, or if Michael wants to bring us back there to John chapter 2, at the end there, verse 23 and 24, that's where it actually talks about Jesus in Jerusalem at the Passover feast and what he was doing there. And it says that 
While he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. So they believed in him on the basis of his miraculous signs that he was doing, but Jesus didn't believe in them. In other words, he didn't believe or he didn't trust. He didn't put his trust in their faith, in the kind of faith that they had based on his miraculous signs. So they weren't going far enough. And um, those are the people that it's talking about here. Uh, many of them had come up to the Passover from Galilee, and then they had moved back. And now they heard that Jesus himself was coming to town, and they were really excited about that because they had seen all these miraculous signs, and they were hoping that Jesus would come and do some more miraculous signs. Hey, he's here. This guy's here. He's going to do cool stuff. He's going to um, do awesome stuff and heal people and do great things. So they welcomed him. But this welcome was actually a kind of dishonoring to Jesus. Jesus said a prophet has no honor in his hometown or in his own country. Why does a prophet have no honor in his own country? Um, th this saying comes up in the other Gospels too. And I think the context is a bit more clear in the other Gospels. Uh, for example, Jesus uh, one time in his hometown um, in Mark chapter 6, um, Mark chapter 6, verse 2 and 4, we could, could look at that. Jesus is in his home country at this point, and he's talking and, and speaking out the word of God, and he's teaching, and people are kind of amazed at first, but then they start asking questions, and they go, where did this man get these things? What's this wisdom that has been given him, that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? And the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives and in his own house, is a prophet without honor. So they kind of knew Jesus' background. They knew who he was. And they were like, okay, like, where's this guy I think he's coming from here? He's coming in, doing all these big things. He's a big servant of God and prophet guy, but we know who this guy is. He's just, he's just that carpenter. He's just that guy. Like we know his family. We know who this guy is. Uh, and they took offense at him because of that and they didn't receive him. So, um, I don't know, it's interesting to think of honor and a prophet having honor. Now, Jesus wanted to be recognized and honored as a prophet, but People were just recognizing and honoring him as a miracle worker, as someone from whom they could just get some kind of benefit. Instead of acknowledging him as a prophet and giving him the honor that was due to him as a prophet, the honor due to a prophet is someone who speaks the word of God and you, you listen to them and you learn from them and you confront, you're confronted with God and you respond to God. So that's the kind of honor that Jesus expected or deserved, but it's not the kind of honor that he got. So people were not, um, you know, that word honor has to do with, with valuing and worth. It has to do with the kind, of, the kind of worth that you put on someone or attribute to them, the way that you value them. It's giving honor. It's a deference to them, who they are, reverence to them, given the position that they have or what God is doing through them or, or God's, you know, we honor each other. It's to recognize the value and worth of the other person um, who's been made in God's image, who's precious and dear to God. So we honor each other and we honor those through whom God is doing things that are, are good and that benefit us. We give them honor, ideally. But Jesus was talking about this as not receiving honor. And then I think it's interesting that in this uh, context where there's a general response to not be honoring Jesus, um, then we get this, this encounter with this one man. And I think he teaches us an example of how to honor Jesus, because he himself responds in a different way, and we, we learn a lot about his faith. Okay, so let's go to uh, verse 46. 
Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Close to death. So he was at Capernaum, which is about 14 miles or 22 kilometers away from Cana. Jesus came back to Cana. That's where he had turned water into wine. So Jesus was at Cana. This guy was in Capernaum. He was there with his family. His son was sick. He had some kind of serious illness. It was regarded as terminal. They understood him to be close to death. They thought he was just about to die. This guy's son was just about to die. And he's sitting there at Capernaum. He probably tried many things to get his son to be healed, but he hears that Jesus is in the area. And he thinks to himself, okay, this is an opportunity for me to get healing for my son, whom I dearly love. And he says, this is my chance. And so he goes and he walks the 14 miles from Capernaum to Cana to get Jesus to come and heal his son. Okay, so he says, um, it says he begged him to come and heal his son. Now, you keep in mind that this guy was a royal official, so he probably was, you know, well-dressed and used to people honoring him and, and respect. But he was begging Jesus, and Jesus was sort of a carpenter, poor rabbi, looking kind of shabby. But he's begging Jesus. This is how he comes to Jesus at first. He actually has some measure of faith because he believes that Jesus can heal his son. And he believes that Jesus will be willing to heal his son. And that's why he stakes. I mean, this last moments of his son's life, he chooses to go to Jesus and, and trust that Jesus will do something about it. And he uses that, those last moments. So we can see that he's got some kind of faith when he comes to Jesus. He already believes in some way. But he comes to Jesus and he begs him to come and heal his son. And then Jesus gives him this response that seems somewhat abrasive and difficult. I mean, he says, Jesus says to him, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. And if you think about, you know, what you might expect or want from Jesus when you're begging him to heal your son, you might want him to be kind of tender and gentle or compassionate, something like that, or say, oh, I'm really sorry, or you know, but he says, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you'll never believe. It's a kind of rebuke. And it's interesting because this is a rebuke that Jesus is giving not just to this royal official, but to you people, to you. The you there is plural. It's not meant to be just this guy. Somehow, uh, for some reason, Jesus tells him. You know, he, he gives this rebuke, which is actually directed to the people around him. Not only to him. Uh, but this is his response. It's a kind of challenge. Um, the royal official shows his humility and his perseverance by the way that he responds to Jesus. He says, sir, come down before my child dies. You know, he doesn't kind of get caught up uh, debating Jesus or like, you know, why are you or criticizing Jesus or something for not being kind enough or I don't know. He just says, sir, come down before my child dies. My child is about to die. This word child here is a kind of a tender word for a, for a heart that a, a parent would have toward their child. And he's just he just simply says to Jesus, look, I need, I need you to help. I need you to help my son right now. And so there you find this, this father who's humbling himself, who's, uh, who's got this heart for his son, who's begging Jesus, who's opening his heart to Jesus. And then how does Jesus respond this time? It's very interesting. Jesus says, you may go, your son will live. And uh, that, in the NIV, your son will live, uh, actually is a little bit interpretive because the, the expression is actually just your son lives or your son is living. So here you have this interesting dynamic that the royal official is like, sir, come down. He says to Jesus, Jesus, come down. Come down to Capernaum so that you can heal my son. And Jesus responds to him, go away. You go. Your son is living. 
And at this point, I mean, you think about the how how did this guy feel? How did he? Uh, how would you feel if you were him at this time? You meet Jesus, you're encountering him, you're thinking he's like your only hope, you're pinning your only hope on him, and you're thinking like, look, healing, how does healing work? The guy who heals people, he has to come there, and he's got to like put his hands on my son and then release the healing blessing by touching him. You know, contact and presence need to be there. And Jesus just goes, okay, go back home. Your, your son's alive. In other words, this is kind of, it could easily be interpreted as fine. I mean, what Jesus means is everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Go home. Your son's okay. But, uh, you know, if you're thinking about this guy and your expectations that you're coming to Jesus with, it seems like Jesus is not meeting those. He's not coming back with you as you're asking him to. And now if he goes back, he turns around. He's like, okay, now I go home. I don't have the healing guy with me. I'm going to go back to my son who's about to die or maybe is already dead. This isn't working. This isn't good, right? You might have lots of reasons to think, you know, I I don't know. If I was him, I was thinking like, I'm a royal official. I'm just going to be like, Jesus sounds like he's not coming. All right, get my bodyguard out to just like take Jesus by force and put him in the van and like carry him and make him do it. But Jesus is like, go. Um, And Jesus' words are very challenging to this man's paradigm. I'm, I'm assuming that this guy had never imagined somebody who could heal like long distance, like 22 kilometers away. Uh, that doesn't seem to be reported elsewhere. You know, even the great people in the Bible, who even Elijah, who came to heal a woman's son, he had to like, he had to like go in the room. You remember Elijah, how he heals the woman's son who's like ba- basically dead, and he has to go in there and he's like lying on his body, like for a long time and like praying and really, you know. And then finally, the son comes up, comes back to life. But Jesus is just like, he's okay. He's never met him before. He's never met this guy's son. He doesn't know who he is, where he is. I mean, humanly, in his human body, right? So for this guy to hear Jesus say this and then accept his word, that's kind of a huge thing for that to happen. And that's why I say this guy this guy is an example to us of faith and of how to respond to Jesus. Um, it says in the NIV translation, the man took Jesus at his word and departed. And that verse there, that is also just more simply or directly translated, he believed Jesus' word. He believed Jesus' word and departed. He trusted in Jesus' word. And by trusting in Jesus' word, he trusted in Jesus himself who spoke that word. And he turned around and walked home. And it seems like he actually, because when his servants met him, they met him the next day. So it seems like he, so, okay, all right, what time is it? When he meets Jesus, it's 1 p.m., the seventh hour. Okay, one in the afternoon, he probably got up really early and did the 22-kilometer trek you know, and he just got into town and he met, went up to Jesus. It was one o'clock in the afternoon and he meets Jesus at that time. But to go back home um, would, would take a long time. It seems like he stayed overnight somewhere before going back home. So he didn't even just rush back home. In other words, right? He, he actually slept somewhere that night and then he made the rest of the journey in the next morning to go back home. So based on Jesus' word, He's like, okay, I trust that what he's saying is going to happen. He said it, and I believe it, and that's it. So who? what is that saying? He says it, I believe it, that settles it. That's enough. How did this guy do this? You know, it's a little bit mysterious to me how he could actually put his trust in Jesus' word. 
or why he would choose to put his trust in Jesus' word like this. But in that moment, you know, when Jesus speaks, he's got this choice. And his choice is, okay, I can accept his word, put my trust in it, and then rely on that. Or I can choose to disregard what Jesus has said. And it's the difference between, you know, hope and despair. It's the difference between, you know, life and death. It's the difference between faith, salvation. So how are you doing? Are you taking Jesus at his word? When you're hearing Jesus' word, do you take him at his word? Do you you trust in Jesus' word? Do you believe in Jesus' word? Do you trust in him? Do you trust in the words that Jesus speaks above your own understanding? Above your own feelings? Above the opinions and advice of other people around you? Do you you know what that is to trust in Jesus' word like this? I think it's an example. And that's, it's something that honors Jesus when we trust in his word. When he speaks his word to us and we hear it and we respond with trust and obedience. Um, okay, I'm going to just go through the rest of the story a bit and then expand a little bit on this. And my sermon is probably not going to be too long today. Um, the man takes Jesus at his word and departs. While he's still on his way home, his servants meet him and they give him the news that his son is alive. Just like exactly what Jesus said. They come up, they're like, your son's alive. It's exactly what Jesus said. Your son's alive. So your son's alive. He hears the news. And interestingly, he doesn't just go, yay, I'm so happy. Great. Good news. He inquires. He makes an inquiry. And that word is like, you know, someone who really wants the answer to a pressing question that he has. He's got this pressing question that he wants the answer to. He says, what time did he get better? What time did he get better? And they say to him, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. So, you know, he's on the, he's alive. He's on the process back to recovery. But there was a point where the sickness broke, where the fever that was leading him toward death, and it was almost on the verge of death, was broken off. And he started the process to recover. What time did that happen? It happened at the seventh hour. The father realized this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And so he and all of his household believed. So now we see again this faith. We see this man progressing in faith and deepening in faith. Three times in this passage, we see him illustrating some kind of faith, but it goes deeper and deeper. He starts out, he's like, I believe that Jesus, and this is kind of an act of desperation, I believe that Jesus can do something about my situation. I believe it. I'm coming to him, and he has that much faith to come to Jesus for for the healing. Then when he's challenged with Jesus' word, and Jesus speaks the word of God out to him, then he responds again, and he says, I'm going to trust this. I'm going to go home. But as he's going home, he's got these questions in his mind. He's like, who, how can that happen? How can it be that my son is better? And who is Jesus, and how can he know that that would happen? And how can I rely on his word? How can I rely on it? Is Jesus just a prophet? Is he just happened to know? Is he a good guesser? Did he just kind of say this out of somewhere? Or did Jesus' word make it happen? Or did Jesus' word actually cause my son to live? Did Jesus' word actually bring my son from death to life? Which one is it? What's happening here? That's why the time is so important to, to this father, because he's, he's thinking, he's wrestling. He's like, who is this Jesus who can say this? Who is he? What should my attitude be toward him? And so that's why when he realizes that it was at the exact time when Jesus said this, that his son got better, then he, he, then he, he puts his faith in Jesus in a deeper way. And then his whole family even ends up, his whole household ends up believing And you know what's really interesting? Well, there's a lot of interesting things here. But one thing that's really interesting, there's there's this person later, this woman, I think her name is Susanna, and she's the wife of this guy named Cusa. 
And I don't have the reference right now. I think it's in Luke's gospel. But Joanna, the wife of Cusa, was one of the people who followed Jesus, one of the women who followed Jesus and who ministered to him and took care of his needs and stuff and was, was with him. And um, Joanna was the wife of Cusa, who was one of Herod's uh, household. And so some people speculate that she was actually the wife of this guy, you know, whose household believed. That's not 100% for sure, but there's an interesting connection there. And you think that, I mean, how, how did John find out about this story? How did John know that this happened, this guy's house? Well, if there was some later connection between the members of this household and the group of disciples and Jesus' ministry, like the kind that would be through uh, Susanna, the wife of Cusa. Joanna, sorry, I'm getting this wrong. Joanna, it's Joanna, it's not Suzanne. It's Joanna, the wife of Cusa. Um, his whole household believes. So he must have told them about Jesus and what happened. And they saw this happen. They saw the son was, they were watching the boy and he was about to die. And then suddenly it just broke. The power of that sickness just broke off of him and he just started to get better. They saw this happen. They're like, how did this happen? How th and then he tells them, there's this guy, Jesus, who said to me, your son will live. And at that exact time, the fever broke off of him. That means Jesus is divine. Jesus has, at the very least, such a close connection to the Father God, to God who has power over all things, that he can just say the word and something happens, even where he himself isn't present there, doesn't even know. Jesus can heal at a distance like this. What does it say about who he is, about the person Jesus? And that was this guy's question. Who is this man? Who is this person Jesus? And it's a really good thing that we know that Jesus can heal from a distance because where is Jesus right now? Yeah, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He's in heaven. He's interceding for us. He's praying at the Father's throne. That's where Jesus in his body is right now. So if he's going to heal anybody today, he's got to do it from a distance. And he can and he can do that, and that's how he works. He can work from a distance. Of course, he sent his Holy Spirit, so he himself is present with us through his Spirit. So he's also present, but he's at a distance as well. Well, that's Jesus. He's kind of God. He is God. Um, wow, so this man, this, this guy who was like a royal official, who again, maybe people would not have expected this at all for him to believe, he has this amazing response of faith. And he puts his trust in Jesus' word, he responds to Jesus, and he comes to have this amazing faith in Jesus, who he is. And I think it's just good for us to think about from this passage, what does this teach us about our own response to Jesus? And how are we responding to Jesus? And what kind of faith do we have? And, you know, I wanted to think about this in a couple of ways, especially the thing that was really standing out to me was the way the guy believed in Jesus' words. And do you feel like you hear Jesus' words sometimes? Yeah. Do you read the Bible? How important are Jesus' words to you? How important are Jesus' words to you? I want to ask that question. How important are they? How important should they be? How important should the Bible be to you? Um, how many people here... If I told you, like, okay, surprise, treasure hunt, there's a pot of gold worth, like, $100,000, and it's hidden somewhere out there in the parking lot, how many people would, would bother to spend half an hour searching for it? <laughs> $100,000, whoever finds it gets $100,000 gold. Some of, you wouldn't, some of you wouldn't bother. Some of you would be like, nah. <laughs> Right? How important is Jesus' word to you? How many people are looking forward to lunch today? I'm big time looking forward to lunch today because I know who prepared lunch. And I know it's going to be special. I shouldn't put any pressure, but I'm really looking forward to lunch. I'm like eager for lunch. How is your attitude to God's word? Um, is it as important to you as gold? Is it as important to you as food? 
Is it a treasure to you? Do you treasure it above all other things? <laughs> Amen. By faith, right? You can claim that. Yes, by faith I do, right? By faith I do. I'm going to trust in Jesus' word. If your heart does not tremble at the word of God, there is something wrong. There's something wrong. You're in a spiritual coma. Do you want to be, are you okay with that, being in a spiritual coma? Spiritual ICU unit? Barely hanging on? <laughs> you know, I'm going to share an example with you. This is kind of like, there's a guy that I love. I named two of my children after him, Francis of Assisi. I mean, Isaiah's middle name is Francis, and Leah's middle name is Claire, because Claire is like Francis's friend. And those are two people in history who, who were just like, they just took Jesus at his word to such an extent that Francis is reading the gospel and he says, Jesus says, sell everything you have, you know, and, and give to the poor and follow me. And he just does. He literally does. He gives up everything. He walks out of the town naked. So he gave even his cloak that had been given to him by his dad. He gave it all back. He gave it all away. He walked out of the city naked, and he says, I have another father. Intense. And then he's reading the Bible. Well, I don't know if he really did this, because so much about his life is, is kind of, it's hard to sort out exactly, but um, apparently one time he's like reading the gospel, and he's, he's trying to preach, he's trying to tell somebody else about this, right? You need to live a life of, of discipleship, and you need to follow Jesus. And he's reading it, and he says, and he's reading it, and says, uh, on your journey, don't take any bag, and don't wear any sandals. And then he stops in the middle of the reading the verse because he's wearing sandals, right? And he takes off his sandals and then he comes back and then he finish, keeps reading the book. It's like taking Jesus at his word and being moved by Jesus' word. Jesus' word is a lifeline to us. It's like, it's like an umbilical cord from heaven that nourishes us, that brings nourishment and that gives us life and gives us light. Jesus' word is a creative, life-giving power. It has the power to dispel the darkness of our hearts and our unbelief and our dark emotions. And it has the power to bring life and light where there is none at the time. I don't know if you experience this, but for me, one example that I'm struggling with these days and this is this is a this is a famous one. Maybe many of you have heard this before, but I'm just going to read it because it's important to me in my life right now. You can pray for me about this. Um, Jesus said in Matthew chapter six, verse. Um, well, it's at the end of a section. I'll just read the the last part. But he says, um, "Okay, I'll just read it from verse twenty-eight." Actually, I'm just read the whole section. Sorry, from verse twenty-five. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And I don't know about you, but I hear that word from Jesus, and I'm like, how do I respond to that word? Um, and I find, you know, I had last year, last winter, I had a really, really hard term. And at the start of that term, I felt like God was telling me, I'm going to teach you what it means to not worry about tomorrow and just 
worry about the tasks of today and entrust to me and see how I work out tomorrow for you. And then I'm realizing about myself this term that somehow that was a lesson that God wanted me to learn for my life, not just for last winter. But I learned it for last winter and then I kind of just le left it go or forgot about it after that. But don't worry about tomorrow. I worry all the time. I'm so anxious. I'm so worried all the time about everything. And it just comes out of my relationships and I feel I'm really like not fun to be around because of my anxiety, my worries. So many times Jesus says, don't worry. What kind of benefit is it to you to worry? And, and seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And I look at that word and I'm like, Jesus, can that be realistic? Can this be in any way realistic in our time or in my life? That I would just seek your kingdom and your righteousness as my top priority, no matter what else is going on, and then you'll take care of me and I'll trust you that you'll actually take care of me. And I'll live like that. Could I actually live like that? Instead of living full of anxiety and trying to store up for myself and trying to plan out and exhaust myself with all my labor, working to have food and and then, can I live like that? You know, I asked God that one time. I'm like, can I actually, God, could I actually seek first your kingdom and righteousness? And then God's like, are you asking me this question? Are you asking me this question right now? He said it. He said it. We can put our faith in his word. His word needs to come and transform our hearts. We need to put our trust in his word and let it change us and let it change our hearts. Let it come in. Invite it in. Invite his word in. Hold to it. Hold on to it. I want to give you a couple of words. This is my conclusion here. Um, I want to look at Proverbs 8 and just the attitude toward God's word. Okay, this has been something on my heart this whole year. And I felt like this was like God's direction in a way for people in our church this whole year. I don't know if people are listening to this. I don't know how people are responding to this, but I think it's important. And I think we really need to get this. Our attitude towards the word of God. What is it? Okay, let's read Proverbs 8. It says, Does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights along the way, where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gates, yeah, everyone can read it out, okay? Leading the city to entrance, she cries aloud, To you, O men, I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind. You who are simple, gain prudence. You who are foolish, gain understanding. Listen, for I have worthy things to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true, for my lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They are faultless to those who have knowledge. Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. I possess knowledge and discretion. To fear the Lord is to hate evil, I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have understanding and power. By me, kings reign and rulers make laws that are just. By me, princes govern and all nobles who rule on earth. I love those who love me and those who seek me find me. With me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness along the paths of justice, bestowing wealth on those who love me and making their treasuries full. The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works. Before his deeds of old, I was appointed from eternity, from the beginning, before the world began. When there were no oceans, I was given birth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled in place, 
Before the hills, I was given birth. Before he made the earth or its fields or any of the dust of the world, I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundary so that waters would not overstep his command, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was the craftsman at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world and delighting in mankind. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Listen to my instruction and be wise. Do not ignore it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. For whoever finds me finds life and receives favor from the Lord. But whoever fails to find me harms himself. All who hate me love death. Whew. Yeah. Um, so what, what should be our attitude to the word of the Lord? Isaiah knows. <laughs> it should be, it should be more a treasure to us than gold and silver and rubies, all these riches of the world. It should be such a priority to us. You know, I have one other thing that I, I wanted. This one's a lot shorter. Psalm 119, verse 9 to 16. In case you're like, oh, Solomon, he's, he's too like intellectual or something. Then you can get like more of a worship guy like David, who says this about, and he's talking about the word of God. Okay. If you want, you can read this with me too. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. I will not neglect your word. So, if you're neglecting God's word, don't don't just feel bad about yourself or something. Just stop doing that. Just give your attention to him. Give him time. Seek out ways to be in his presence. To open your Bible, to pray, to invite the Holy Spirit. Do you know the Holy Spirit lives in you if you have faith in Jesus? And the Holy Spirit loves the Bible. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible through and with human authors. He inspired it. And he loves to guide us into all truth. He's the spirit of truth who guides us into all truth. You can sit down anytime and ask the Holy Spirit, guide me into the truth now, Lord. And he will because he loves you and he wants you to have the riches and and abundance and the treasures of the knowledge of God. He wants it from you, you know. So, all right. So I'm going to end today by asking us to get into groups of like at least two or three people, two, three, four people. I'm thinking around three is a good number if you can get into groups of three. And let's let's share with each other, okay, some words you are challenged by that you want to hold on to, to pray from the Lord. Or if someone in your group doesn't have any words right now, maybe you can share and give them some words of God. It can be from the passage that we studied today. Let's encourage each other and pray for each other. And, and so after that, we'll take about... 10 minutes and then and then we'll uh, concluding prayer together and then we'll we'll go and have so can we get in groups I just keep going that's okay all right so those people who aren't currently engaged in praying with somebody else uh if we, if you could just uh we'll just pray together okay heavenly father um thank you god for jesus christ the living word of God. Thank you that Jesus Christ reveals you to us, Father. 
Thank you that he speaks to us. Thank you that your word is life-giving and precious above all earthly things, God. And help us to just honor you, Jesus, and honor your word. Please come, God, and create a, a spirit of honor toward your voice and your word. Lord Jesus, we would love to hear you speaking so much more to us, God, because when you speak to us, it creates life. It gives life. It, it turns us from despair. It turns us from our emotional darkness and turmoil and, and pain. And Lord, your word is awesome. Um, please, uh, please give all of us, Lord, a heart to pay attention to your word, to desire it more than gold. Lord, make that really happen. I, re I repent, Lord, at my bad attitude to your word. I just want to repent to you, Lord Jesus, that I feel like you've been telling me not to worry for so long, and I just worry and worry. Lord, I want your word to create in me a right, a right attitude, Lord. I want my inner life to line up with your word, with your truth, with the glory of your revelation, God. And uh, God, I just pray that for all of your people here and that we could encourage each other and speak your word to one another in love, God, and build one another up as we go on from here today. And uh, yeah, may your blessing rest on, on your people, Lord. May you shine your light, the light of your glory and your presence into our hearts, Lord Jesus, this week so we could also reflect that all around in our lives and people around us. In Jesus' name, amen.